the following remarks uh, so we can um, we can remember uh, what they talked about and, and interact about that topic rather than waiting towards the end. Uh, but uh, please keep your questions uh, for the end of the um, uh, first finish the remarks and then we'll go into question and answer. And um, uh, I'll, I'll be looking to spark the conversation a little bit as much as I can, but uh, I, I much appreciate any questions and comments that come out of the audience. So with that, our, our first speaker is uh, Michiel Streiland. He is a, a consultant with uh, APPM. APPM is a, a management consulting firm with about 200 people. And um, uh, Michiel is a head of uh, business development for new mobility in the US. Michiel is located in, uh, in San Francisco. And APPM uh, has a particular purpose and uh, that is to help governments and companies develop mobility strategies that work. Uh, particularly for cities that are rapidly changing, uh, to keep them livable, to combat congestion and fight air pollution. ABPM helps with the need to change our mobility behavior, and they believe that we need to shift to active mobility, uh, particularly cycling, as we Dutch are very familiar with, uh, but also public transportation and uh, and create hubs, hub functionality uh, to to facilitate that. And they also have a keen interest in anything that helps the transition to electric transportation. So, uh, Michiel, I'll uh, hand the microphone to you. And uh, if you want to share your screen, uh, if you have any, any slides to share, that would be much appreciated. I'll put myself on mute now as well. All right. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Does everybody see my screen? Yep. Awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, APPM, uh, uh, what it is that we do here in, in the US, uh, um, our strategy, and I want to end my story with uh, a call to action. Um, my, call to, my colleague Bob is also in the call, so uh, if the questions get really tough, uh, I know he will help me. Um, so my story starts nine, nine months ago. On the photo on the left, you might see the, the fear in my eyes, because that's the moment we flew from Amsterdam to, to San Francisco, me and my wife. Um, uh, to live here um, and even though I was a bit scared it, it was not necessary uh, we, we live in the middle of San Francisco we have an amazing time and uh, so far it's been a really great experience uh, and in that time I also started working for APPM and um, we had a short introduction already but but what we do is we we develop solutions for today's mobility challenges with new technologies uh, 100 experts, more than 20 years ex of experience, and offices in the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, and the West Coast. Uh, and our mission is to shift to smart and zero emission mobility uh, to keep cities livable and to save the environment. Uh, our products are broadly um, setting up cross-border networks to support knowledge sharing, uh, develop new strategies based on data modeling and expertise, and um, make new technologies and public-private corporations work. So implement new technologies together with governments and, and companies. Um, our three main focus areas are, of course, one of them is cycling. Uh, we are a Dutch company, so we, we have to focus on cycling. But we also believe that with after the COVID-19 crisis, when people get back to work, this will be a really big opportunity, uh, uh, for, especially for uh, originally Dutch companies uh, with, with our knowledge. Uh, mobility hubs are a little bit more uncertain. Nobody really knows what public transportation is going to look like after um, after COVID. Um, but today we're going to focus on e-mobility as that is the space we, we do most in uh, so far and we focus on at this moment. Um, so we made a short analysis of e-mobility in California. And I think these are numbers most of you can, can dream already. So I'm, I'm going to skim to them uh, quite fast. Um, important is that the uptake of EVs is much faster here uh, in, in California compared to anywhere else in the, in the US. So 50% of all EVs in the United States drives around in California. And uh, I believe that 8% of EV sales last year uh, of, of car sales were EVs. Um, and of course, innovative companies from California dominate the market. Uh, what is also interesting is that, that the charging network here is, is quite developed, um, and not, not compared to the Netherlands perhaps, but, but still it's, it's a quite developed network. Um, the, California is also really ambitious. Uh, 
the most well known are the, the 5 million zero emission vehicles on the roads by 2030 and the 250,000 EV charging stations. But what you really see is that in every different sector, ranging from uh, trucking to trans transit to, to airport shuttles, there are all these really ambitious targets to, to shift to zero emission mobility. Um, and there are also support measures to, to implement that. So the zero emission vehicle mandate is, I think, the, the one that's most well known. Um, 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 but there are, there are many others. Um, for me, as a, as a, uh, coming from the Netherlands, it was really interesting to see the, the big emphasis on public information campaigns. So um, in, in the Netherlands, uh, you, you sometimes hear that uh, EV is for the rich, uh, the, the grachtengordel. Um, um, it's um, mostly uh, uh, yeah, rich people who can buy Teslas uh, who actually drive them. But here there's a real emphasis on getting the message across that, that everybody needs to join, that everybody wants to join, and, and also trying to help people who cannot afford an EV to, to buy one. Um, uh, another one is the right to charge, which I think is really interesting, uh, that people get the right to charge their, their vehicle uh, when they live in a multi-unit housing. Um, of course, today we're talking about Los Angeles. Uh, the 2028 Summer Olympics have made a real push for even more electric vehicles um, with their own new targets, uh, their own new charging uh, infrastructure. But also really important for this region is the, uh, the ecosystem and the, and the high number of innovative companies that are uh, working in this space. Mm -hmm. So. We, we've selected four major market opportunities on, in e-mobility that we see at this moment in the United States. Uh, and I think they might be interesting for, uh, for some of the Dutch companies who are, are joining us. Um, with the increasing number of electric vehicles, there is an increasing need for public charging. Um, most people charge their car at home right now, but, but that is rapidly changing. So there needs to be a public charging infrastructure. And with a public charging infrastructure, there's also a need for smart charging and data networks, interoperabilities. Of course, these are all areas Dutch companies are quite uh, good at, so th that's a real opportunity. Um, together with, with this growing network, there's a need for new strategies um, and also um, new technologies. Of course, California is, is a front runner on many areas, but, but there are many other technologies all around the world that can be implemented right here. So to give you a little bit of an idea of what, what it is what we do and also what it is that we uh, try to realize here in California, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a project we did in Utrecht, which is actually my hometown in the Netherlands, which you can compare to uh, a neighborhood in Los Angeles, uh, 300,000 people, um, a, a city with a really strong aim for zero emission uh, transport. Um, but as always, there's a lack of budget and there's a lack of public space. So they asked us to, to, to find a strategy to how to scale up installations for up to char charge, uh, 1,000 charging points a year. And um, what we did is we made an analysis first of the growth of the electric vehicles per area. We defined the number of charging stations needed, and we also looked where to actually place these charging stations. And um, this strategy led to a first an analysis of what is already there, and then an analysis of where the, uh, the, the problems will, are going to be. So in this way, we got a really detailed map of where uh, there was a clear need for charging points. And working this way had, a really, had some really interesting results. So we developed a five-year strategy, um, which meant we, we could give a long-term perspective to the uh, charge point operators. Um, we matched supply and demand. And we actually made most charging locations profitable instead of costing money for the city as they were used far more often. Um, because we knew which, how many charging locations we need to, to, get, to buy, we could implement smart procurement and a better collaboration between all the uh, different stakeholders. And uh, I wanted to tell you about this example because there are some really clear lessons, I think, for California. Um, to use a sports anal analogy, uh, don't look where the ball is, look where the ball is going. Analyze current charging locations and um, expected future needs. Work together with all stakeholders. So what, what I see here quite often is that the municipality builds a, a charging location uh, because they think they need one without thinking 
um, who is going to use it if there's perhaps another charging location a few hundred meters far away. Um, um, there, there's no idea behind it. So work together with all the different stakeholders. And by working together, you can develop a long-term strategy where data sharing, interoperability are all uh, play a role. And also you can um, use smart procurement to lower your prices significantly. So this is the, the call to action I, I spoke about in the beginning. Uh, we are changing mobility and we ask you to join. We can only do this together. And um, I think everybody in this call is a potential ally to, to, to help us, uh, to help each other to change mobility. So um, I'm going to end it here with my contact information. Uh, of course, uh, I'm here for, for questions as well. But uh, yeah, let's do this together. Great. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Michiel. Uh, so very interesting to me. So anybody who has questions, uh, please use the chat box and, uh, and make them known. Uh, I'll start with a question. So a right to charge. I never really thought about it, never heard about it before. Um, can you tell the audience a little bit more about this? What does it mean? How does it show up for people? So, so there are uh, really uh, a lot of multi-residential uh, buildings uh, here, but also in the Netherlands, of course. And what, what makes it really tough is that um, um, if you want an EV charging location, um, uh, but your neighbors don't want it, um, and, but perhaps they have to uh, uh, help in the investment or they have to agree on it. Uh, um, uh, in the Netherlands, you have the, the, the famous VVAs, uh, mm -hmm. the ownership associations. Um, mm -hmm. You have to pass that. Well, the, the, the right to charge gives people the right to actually build lo uh, charging infrastructure in those locations. Okay, so it's a, it's a permitting vehicle, so it makes it easier for people yeah, exactly. to request and get uh, an approval for a charging station in front of your building. Yeah, exactly. It, okay, very good, very interesting. Um, very good. So um, can you say a little bit, Michiel, about your approach for APPM in California and how you're how you're pursuing business and what you, uh, do you have any uh, comments about um, what it's like to be pursuing business as, a, yeah. as a, an outpost like this? Yeah, sure. So um, when I when I got here, the first thing I noticed is how uh, in infectiously uh, positive everybody is here. So everybody you talk to, everybody agrees with you. Everybody's happy. You, of course, the, the message we're we're bringing, everybody agrees with that, especially here in in California. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, getting to the next step is a whole different thing. So Americans might act really uh, happy and 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 they, they like they want to do, work together. But uh, eventually, you might never hear from them again. And mm -hmm. perhaps that comes because we are, well, a smaller, originally European company. Uh, we, we don't have a proven track record. So our strategy at the moment is really to partner up with, with local partners who have already shown what they can do uh, to make it less scary for us to, to join, for, for us to, to win an RFP, for example, a quest for proposal, and um, yeah, do it together, show what mm -hmm. we got. Yeah. From your very interesting, from, from your experience so far, what what are the main things that California could learn from the Netherlands? I mean, you mentioned bicycles. Distances are greater. So if, if, if you were to say, what, what is it that you would bring along with you from the Dutch uh, public infrastructure? So the Dutch are really champion uh, champions on, on charging infrastructure. And, and, and that is because uh, of, uh, well, the, the, perhaps the, the polder, the, the working together, uh, mm -hmm. And I think that is something that that, that people can learn a lot about. Um, the, the American uh, system is really fractured with a lot of different municipalities, transport agencies, cities, all with their own strategy. Um, but by working together, you can actually uh, impose uh, um, um, standard protocols, but also smart procurement, for example. Interesting. Anybody else in the audience uh, got any questions? Please use the chat box. Um, so, um, Michiel, is there anything you can say about uh, projects you have, have running so far in the U.S., or is it yeah, yeah. anything so about it? It's actually in Canada, uh, but we did a really cool uh, assignment in Vancouver, um, where we mm -hmm. uh, tried to, we analyzed the local EV markets and, and actually um, uh, looked for market opportunities for, for Dutch companies and then set up meetings um, to um, well, make, make these make them act on these these opportunities, and we're actually in the first phase of that. But we, we that's really trying what we try to do is build a bridge between the two different regions. So you help broker relationships. Very yeah, interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. Okay, good. 
Um, so if uh, there's no questions from the audience, then I'd like to uh, move on and thank you, Michiel, for your for your comments and your for, for your perspective. Um, so next topic we'd like to spend some time talking about is the uh, is the uh, environment, the legislative environment in California, and particularly Measure M. You hear my dog barking in the background. It's dinner time here, so I'll go on mute for a second and address him as well. But uh, so yeah, Jan Top is uh, is with us here today. He's an economic officer at the Consulate General of the Netherlands. He's been in San Francisco for about a year now. And uh, so we've actually organized this webinar in, in collaboration with, uh, with Jan and his organization. So Jan's going to tell us a little bit more about uh, mobility challenges in Los Angeles and uh, to, to discover together how they can possibly benefit from Dutch ideas, solutions and experience. He will specifically dive into the, the measure M, as I said before. So uh, Jan, uh, take the microphone, please. Thank you, Lucas, for uh, int introducing me. Let me try to share my screen. Wait a moment. That worked before, but right now, yeah, it is going to work. Yes. So as Lucas said, we have been organizing this together. And the idea of this entire webinar is just to inform um, um, uh, Dutch communities who are interested in doing business in LA um, about the different opportunities there. Um, and my role today is just to give you guys a little bit of an overview with regard to the different challenges, challenges, the different agencies involved, also a little, about, a little bit about the funding, um, and also, um, yeah, what is a good good place to start when it comes to doing business in LA. And I also would like to encourage you to ask your questions to the, all the speakers we, we've, we've here today. Uh, these are here, uh, especially here today, in order to uh, inform you guys about like their takes and, and their uh, experience with regard to doing business in LA. And um, I think um, the best the, the best thing is to ask them questions instead of me. So I, I'll, I'll keep it, I'll try to uh, give you guys an overview and then, um, uh, uh, yeah, I rather give the floor to uh, uh, the, 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 the different companies. So let me start with some facts and figures. Um, when it comes to LA, LA is a very, very big, big uh, LA County is a very big area. We're talking about eight, 88 cities um, with more than 10 million inhabitants. And there is like a projected growth uh, in 2028 uh, of about, uh, yeah, another 750,000 uh, people. So 10.75 million people in uh, in 2028. So it's a, it's a vast area. Um, when it comes to, let me zoom in, in an, a little bit on the uh, uh, mobility figures, if, uh, then we'll see that uh, about 4.4 million people are commuting every single day. And uh, almost 90% of them um, lives in the proximity of a transit hub. Um, but uh, despite that fact, we will see we see that almost 90% uh, uh, of, of the commuters is still using the car. So it's a very car-minded city. Um, the majority owns and drives a car. And I thought maybe the reason for them driving a car is because of the infrequent service uh, of, of transit. Uh, but that's not, not really true because 3 million, 3 million people of the 4 million people are living close to a transit hub with high frequent services. Um, by the way, these, the data I'm showing here comes from AC Transit. It's a very nice website with a lot of numbers um, from different cities uh, throughout the US and also in Canada. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is focusing on, on LA. So um, I, I'd like to encourage you to, uh, if you want to know more about the uh, uh, figures with regard to mobility, but also with regard to jobs, then um, uh, please go there and, uh, and, and dive in a little bit. Um, so, but let's go to the map. Um, because I got curious to see uh, as to the relationship between jobs and transit. And this map shows that this relationship is not too bad. The brighter the color, uh, the more dense the amount of jobs in the vicinity of a transit hub, hub gets. Um, but then this, these figures show that um, the duration of a trip, if you drive or yeah, uh, travel from, from, job, from, from work to, uh, from house to, uh, to, to your job and vice versa, the duration is more than 30 minutes in 90% in of the cases. Um, and the numbers, the numbers, yeah, they don't lie. Um, we're having about 400, four, sorry, 4 million uh, commuters and only 230,000 people are um, able to 
uh, finish their trip within the limit of 30 minutes. So there is something which probably could, uh, could be improved. Uh, when it comes to, yeah, to cycling and, and biking, that is not very popular in, in Los Angeles, as the numbers show. Let's dive in a little bit into the different agencies involved with regard to uh, uh, mobility. Um, LA County is a vast area, as I already said, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a big area. And also when it comes to the transportation agencies involved with regard to different mobility issues, that is also very, uh, 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 yeah, it, it's very large. So the different agencies on the federal level, on the state level, on the regional level, and on the lowest level, the, the, the county or the local level. Um, let me just highlight a few. Uh, Caltrans, for example, is the, is, is the uh, organization uh, responsible for construction, operation, maintenance, and infrastructure uh, on the state level. And uh, probably you could compare uh, 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 Caltrans to Rex Maanstad, the Dutch um, uh, Highway uh, Road Authority. Um, let me zoom in a little bit then uh, uh, and, and go to the regional scale. Then the Southern California Association of Governments is uh, um, um, in charge of um, planning, coordinating, and administering federal, state, and local funds. Um, and then we zoom in to, to, to a little bit uh, of a, a smaller geographical scale than we're talking about uh, LA Metro, which is also uh, um, um, yeah, in charge of um, drafting the expenditure plan for self-imposed voter and voter-improved uh, sales tax measures, so, such as uh, Measure M, and that is uh, the measure uh, Lucas was already mentioning in the uh, in the um, uh, in the introduction. Yeah, this this scheme is just to show you that um, again, there are like many different uh, financial resources uh, 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 which are uh, uh, contributing to different projects. So I'd like to encourage you to um, yeah uh, to have a look at it uh, uh, later on uh, um, after this presentation because the slides will be uh, posted on our. Um, platform, the, the mission platform. So as I said, maybe it's good just to uh, to zoom in a little bit on LA Metro, because LA Metro is the organization who administers and uh, and makes an expenditure plan for the self-imposed measure, such as Measure M, but also there's also another measure, Measure, dot, measure R. Um, LA Metro is involved with uh, uh, all different modalities. So we're, then we're talking about rail, uh, regional transit, highway, and active transportation. And um, they actually drafted a very nice uh, uh, um, document, which is called the LA Metro, LA Metro Vision 2028. And um, this is a must read for if you are interested in doing business in LA and would like to know a little bit more about the different challenges. I listed the different challenges uh, um, um, LA Metro was able to identify them for themselves uh, here on the, on the, on the slide. Um, and, for them to be able to identify these uh, these challenges, they went through a very uh, um, large and, and, and long-lasting process, a stakeholder involvement process. So they did, they uh, performed a lot of interviews. They did a lot of uh, they handed out a lot of questionnaires in order to get to know from uh, the population living in, uh, in 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 LA County what the challenges are. And let me highlight, um, yeah, a few. Um, the, the, yeah, the continued growth in demand is training and an and already all oversubscribed transportation system. And that, that, that is so true because, I mean, um, um, the demand for the transportation of people and the demand of transportation uh, of, of goods is, is, is only rising. And that uh, definitely uh, has a pressure on the already uh, very busy and crowded transportation system. Um, and when it comes to addressing that, they're, 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 yeah, they're saying, yeah, we'd like to find ways in order to use the capacity for having more efficiently and they do they also would like to um, use to to harness to use technical innovations with regard to that so the technical innovation aspect we're uh, seeing listed on the uh, on this slide is not not in particular a challenge it's more like a, a an opportunity for LA Metro to address the different challenges they're dealing with and when it comes to uh, the techno techno technological innovation they're thinking of is, for example, when it comes to transit, to provide the different um, uh, users of transit with uh, uh, clear information and uh, uh, information, information they, they can count on. Um, one last thing I'd like to highlight is that 
uh, LA Metro also identified uh, 28 projects they'd like to deliver before the uh, 2028 games uh, uh, will be uh, uh, organized, and that will be these will be organized in 20 in 2028. And um, the the little uh, 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 block here on the slide uh, has has click clickable links, so I'd like to encourage you to click on these links and see what these projects are about. And there are also a few articles which also criticize that that approach a little bit. Um, yeah, that, that that about the 28 games, uh, sorry, the 28 games and the the, the, the different projects they uh, have identified as uh, being the project to be delivered before that date in order to improve the mobility uh, system. Um, yeah, this is a very nice quote. Um, let me let me skip this, but it it basically says that um, addressing mobility issues is something uh, uh, you won't regret regret because many people, many inhabitants of LA County will definitely uh, benefit from that. Metro also identified, based on these challenges, different performance outcomes they'd like to uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, before 2028. And these are basically um, 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 yeah, focusing on having a more balanced, balanced mobility system. So less people in the car and more people using transit or other, or other modes of transport. Based on these challenges and the different performance, uh, uh, performance uh, uh, objectives, uh, LA Metro has been able to identify um, 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 yeah, the, the sort of goals, the sort of strategies they'd like to uh, follow for the coming years. Um, and when it comes to, uh, uh, yeah, this is actually the first one. The first one is to provide high quality mobility options that enable people to spend less, tra less time traveling. And I, li I listed a few projects which are uh, uh, sort of addressing that particular goal. And let me highlight one. Um, I said already in the beginning, uh, LA is a very car minded city and uh, uh, therefore uh, uh, LA Metro addressed um, uh, the, uh, they came up with the idea to improve the bus plan and to uh, revise that, the bus plan. And that's called the next generation bus plan. And one of the uh, aspects is just to, for example, cancel bus stop stops. A nice, um, a nice aspect, uh, a nice fact is actually that um, about 8% 8, 8 of the 14,000 bus stops in LA uh, accounts for 60% of the total boarding. So that sort of shows that, yeah, there's definitely some room to uh, um, improve the bus system. And the goal of this next generation bus plan is to make the system more reliable, um, have more frequent services, and um, yeah, and that they also have like more people uh, 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 riding uh, the transit system in LA. Let's go to the next goal being identified by LA Metro, which is deliver an outstanding trip experiences for all users of the transportation system. And um, yeah, one of the th aspects to think of, is, think of is, is to improve travel information and predictions, predictions with regard to the duration of trips. And again, I've got some clickable links um, you, for you to uh, 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 explore a little bit more on uh, after this uh, uh, um, presentation and, and webinar. The, the last goal I'd like to highlight is, to, is, the, is the goal with regard to enhancing communities and lives through mobility and access to opportunity. And one of the, their approach, approaches is to um, um, stimulate and, and, and draft guidelines for transit-oriented communities. Um, I'm not gonna go very deep into that, uh, 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 but the, it is very much related to the transit-oriented uh, development uh, uh, um, 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 yeah, uh, phenomenon we all know, we all know about. Um, this is just a few numbers and, and, and a very nice Excel sheet, but these are the two measures um, which are self-imposed and voter approved uh, and, 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 and LA Metro is actually in charge of uh, uh, addressing the expenditure list for these different measures. And the challenges I, I just mentioned and the different uh, uh, goals uh, LA Metro would like to, would like to, uh, 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 yeah, uh, to, to work towards to, uh, um, before 2028, are uh, um, yeah are are, are 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 listed here and also uh, uh, again LA Metro is in charge of of of, of spending the budget and also um, um, yeah uh, granting the budget to different uh, agencies they cooperate with because they're not doing it all this all alone they they they, they cooperate with a lot of local agencies in order to uh, uh, achieve the different goals they have set. 
um, when it comes to when it comes to doing business in LA, um, yeah, many organizations and also LA Metro are very transparent with regard to uh, the, the RFPs they post and the vendor platforms they have. And, um, and I, I encourage you to take a look at these different vendor platforms. Uh, I'm not saying that this is like the road to success, but it definitely shows uh, what is out there. Um, and, uh, and it also, um, it often lists, for example, many uh, providers and contractors with extensive contact information. And um, so that's also a starting point for you to reach out to, for example, these providers and contractors. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a nice starting point for you to start, to start networking. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight is the Office of Extraordinary Innovation, which is um, uh, uh, yeah, asking companies to come up with their, un with their unsolicited ideas, uh, um, which are uh, hopefully uh, uh, contributing to solving problems with regard to mobility in LA, in LA. So if you have any ideas, they, they encourage you to submit these ideas and they will be reviewed by their, uh, yeah, by their board. And uh, uh, if, if it is like a successful idea, uh, it's like to uh, uh, implement it. One last thing I'd like to say is that um, when you want to do business in LA, uh, um, I, and I already said LA is, is vast, it's, it's, it's huge. Many different agencies are involved with many different projects. So if you want to do uh, a business in LA, just follow, uh, just, just have a look at the map. And if you have an expertise on a certain topic, just, um, Search the map for uh, yeah areas where the, the the your expertise your topic manifests itself and try to build up relationships there at that particular particular point where the topic of your uh, 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 interest will uh, manifest them, uh, manifest itself. Um, I think I've got one more sheet. Yeah, exactly. I've got one more sheet, which is about um, the fact that yeah. Um, Myself and also my colleagues in LA, um, uh, 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 Peter Pulse and Daniela Berden, uh, we are very much willing to be the linking pin between different organizations uh, 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 in, in LA, uh, public agencies, but also companies. Um, and we, we gladly would like to introduce you uh, there. So um, that, that's, what, that's what we're here for. We'd like to facilitate your journey. And if you have any, for example, any concrete ideas uh, and you'd like to pitch them for any, yeah, um, uh, uh, relevant parties, just give us a ring, and yeah, we'd like to help to uh, we'd like to help to faci facilitate that. And on the other end, we are also very interested in uh, uh, in, in, in what, the, what you guys uh, drives in order to do to do business in LA. What are the topics of uh, most interest? So um, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to us to contact us. And, uh, and, 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 and chat with us about your interest in, of doing business in LA and um, yeah, to find ways how we could help you in order to uh, set the, uh, yeah, uh, make the next step. Um, one more thing I'd like to mention, by the way, um, Lucas already mentioned it in the uh, introduction. We're having a matchmaking session um, uh, from 10.30 uh, uh, a.m. PST, uh, which, uh, which is uh, um, not, uh, 730 in, in the Netherlands. Um, and the different speakers uh, who are also going to uh, present today, they will be present there as well. So if you um, uh, have, 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 have a scheduled uh, um, a match, match, please go there and, and, and ask your questions uh, to the different speakers uh, of this particular webinar during that particular session. But we also have a sort of walk-in session um, called Office Hours, and that is that we have a, we've got a virtual room there, which is totally de dedicated to LA. So if you don't have like a scheduled appointment, please go there and uh, ask your questions to Daniela Berden from the uh, Netherlands Business Support Office in LA and to uh, Michael Smith. He's from the Los Angeles Economic Development Co Corporation. Um, so there's also an opportunity to uh, ask more questions with regard to do of do, to do being, to doing business in LA. And I'd like to uh, hand it over to you, uh, Lucas. You're on mute, Lucas. Lucas, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> so th thank you, Jan. Um, it was very interesting to hear your your perspective. Um, 
from from the Dutch perspective, we like to uh, look at ourselves as the entry point to Europe. Uh, my question to you is, Jan, uh, to what degree is the Netherlands visible for parties in, in California? And what else can we do to position ourselves uh, for companies like Tesla and for Waymo to have their vehicles tested in the Netherlands, for anybody in the U.S. to look at the Netherlands as the place to innovate and the place to be uh, to find flexible support for for new business? Jan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to unmute myself. So, and, and I just succeeded. I, I think that's a, that's a very good question. So, when it comes to being visible, yeah, um, um, these 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 events were, for example, uh, hosting this week are very much helping in order to make ourselves visible, visible, right? And I think one of the, uh, uh, yeah, a tip uh, uh, we also uh, got from uh, one of the different uh, uh, people we're working with here at the uh, concert is that um, sometimes. Uh, the Dutch people should like dare a little bit more. Uh, just put them, put a, uh, put yourself out there and, and and boast a little bit about your product. Uh, pitch, come up with a very good pitch and 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 try to yeah to really show that you're like nailing it. And that is uh, really helping to make ourselves way more visible and also um, um, gives like gives it gives gives yourself like more chance of of of, of um, yeah, starting relationships and starting business, starting business here. Because if you if you don't nail your pitch, then yeah, um, there are like tons of other people who are who are also waiting down the line to do business with different partners, such as Tesla or Lyft or Uber. Okay, any questions from the audience? I haven't seen a lot of use of the uh, uh, chat functions yet, so I don't want to have to call on an individual participants, but uh, I do like to see some participation. Very good. Um, another question for me then, Jan, since I, uh, I get to monopolize the microphone here, you talked a little bit about um, the failure to introduce um, measures that limit the single occupancy of vehicles. You know, it's typically something we see in the Netherlands as well. Um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation also lately about the effects of COVID-19 on the people's willingness to, uh, to partake in public transportation. Um, to step into a, a taxi or um, use any other facilities. What's the what's the what's the line of thinking currently in in California about the impact of of the crisis that we're living through? Yeah, it's a good, very good question. I'd like to encourage you to ask that to the other speakers as well. But um, uh, um, and I actually have a slide uh, which is with, with some links and. Um, there's a report from the the SCAG organization I mentioned, and they uh, drafted a uh, a document. They wrote a report about uh, the effects of COVID-19 on uh, the transportation system. So, if you'd like to know more, uh, please click on that link. But basically, yeah, um, California has to reprioritize their uh, their their goals a little bit because um, it is definitely true that revenues are plummeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very good. So um, one last question from my side, um, you know, mobility as a service is getting a lot of interest all around the world. People understand it to mean different things. What is your experience of mobility as a service, um, you know, in California? Is it something that's really promoted by government or is it popping up mushrooming just from private initiatives or what's your sense of how this is uh, inserting itself into the mobility landscape in California? So yeah, we, definitely in major cities we see like the the, uh, the 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 mobility as a service as the means in order to have access to different kind of uh, modes of transport um, and and then um, like pay for it via, for example, one uh, easy uh, pay on the go or uh, uh, maybe um, pay by by install by pay by installment uh, 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 um, um, yeah uh, process or strategy. So we definitely, definitely, definitely see these kind of uh, um, um, developments uh, a lot, and yeah, it's also one of the the the, 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 the very promising aspects to uh, um, to balance the system, uh, when it's the mobility system, uh, a, a little bit more. Um, yeah, I'd I'd like to leave leave it here, uh, but I think this is also a very important question for, um, for example, for Fear and Peer and for uh, Arcadis to. And, and, and to ask them this, this particular question as well. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, very good. Um, Jeremy, I'm going to pick on you, and I um, uh, see you in the center of my screen right now. So I'm wondering what's on your mind when you think about the relationship between the Netherlands and California? What is there that you'd like to know? I think for my desk, um, what's interesting about bringing firms from the Netherlands to Los Angeles is the progress that you've made on climate and sea level rise and regional collaboration. I think those are some of the areas that most people in LA will have an opinion that the Dutch are ahead. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think those areas where climate resilience uh, and um, engineering to prepare and uh, adapt infrastructure in particular to changing mm -hmm. climate um, is an area that Dutch companies will have a leg up on, on most others uh, coming from an international context to work in LA. So I think finding those linkages um, and uh, connecting, whether it's an EV interest or whether it's a mobility infrastructure interest or MAS, um, really making those connections to the Dutch's leadership reputation in sustainability and in clever engineering, um, I, I think is, is a core uh, connection point. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for that. So I'll, I'll return that favor and I'll tell you a little bit what we admire about Californians. <laughs> <laughs> we admire Californians for, for their, for their risk-taking behavior, for the private equity industry that really um, where it creates industries out of nothing. And so in the Netherlands, we got a lot of uh, uh, consensus building going on, which is of course good to get broad support for initiatives but we'd like to see some of the spicy elements of Californian life, uh, you know, manifest itself in the Netherlands as well in that regard. Uh, let me look around the room. Uh, Stefan van der Wall, do you have any, uh, any topics in your mind that you'd like to um, share with, with the audience here? I know you're okay, always full you, of ideas, so. Can, <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> uh, I can hear you. Okay, now just for the other people that, uh, just to say sure, briefly who I am, I'm the best developer for the Dutch government uh, for the US. Uh, I'm a listener now, I, be, I depend on the knowledge uh, of all those people that are in this room to hear uh, what they think, what's going on. Um, uh, we spoke before, um, uh, Lucas, uh, about ideas that I have, about the branding, the storytelling uh, from the Netherlands, uh, the way we look at things, the way we find solutions, uh, always trying because we are a small country. We have a lot of people with a very limited space. So whatever we do, whatever solutions we find, we have to do it uh, efficiently. We have to do it integrated. Uh, uh, so that means also with mobility, also with mobility in the urban urban place and uh, actually when I was looking I, I have to really to see the presentation later and, and click on the links and, and read more uh, mm -hmm. to get a wiser also uh, what's going on but also having in mind uh, uh, LA for 2028 that they have to be prepared uh, for the Olympic uh, Games uh, do a lot of investments in their public transportation in their mobility in general I, I'm always interested to see how can you uh, uh, look at it in a more integrated way. Because if, uh, as I said, efficient and integrated, that means also you save money if you do it in that way. And, and with the goals that I have seen in the, uh, in the presentations, I don't see this kind of things back. Uh, maybe I miss something, but it's always about uh, doing something and, 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 and implementing systems that are good for the people, that give them fast transportation, etc., etc. I didn't see much about sustainability, but of course we are talking about EV, uh, so that means that is already um, uh, hanging in there too. Uh, but everything that is combined, you know, uh, everything that has two wheels to 16 wheels, uh, the foots, uh, the bicycles, the public transportation, the, the taxi uh, systems, the car sharing, the parking facility, if you see that all together as mm -hmm. one system, you might be surprised what you can do with that. And, and this is something which I would like to see if we can do something with that with LA, if we can, mm -hmm. can set up a program with that. Uh, we have so many good companies in the Netherlands, consultancies that are specialized in, in, in looking at, in, at the whole picture 
we, we should avoid that uh, LA is big. You see different departments in LA. Everybody yeah. may be doing their own thing. You don't get much wiser of that. We don't want that. So uh, anyway, this is for okay. now because I really Thank have you. to read I, a lot. I didn't detect a question in that. I know you have a lot of uh, good uh, wisdom to share. So we'll move on to Peter Post. He raised his hand. I like to uh, see people use the functionality. So Peter, take the microphone. Yeah, Peter Post here. Um, Jan already introduced me shortly. I'm the chief representative of the Netherlands Business Support Office in uh, in Los Angeles and. Um, it's, it's great that, that we have some attention on mobility here. It's a, it's a big topic. And I think living here now for a few months, and even though with the lockdown, it's for Dutch people very, very important. And I also realize it to understand the context uh, uh, here. Uh, first of all, there is, a, there is a very, very good infrastructure, a metro infrastructure, which is uh, expanding rapidly. However, we have to understand it's like a Randstad rail. So uh, actually it's great, but you have 15 stops from center uh, uh, downtown LA to Santa Monica. It could take 20 minutes, but it takes 50 minutes. So it's not encouraging to take necessarily the metro. Then we have to also realize that there are a lot of homeless people. So a lot of people are a little bit hesitant to take the metro rail. And with the COVID now, it's another problem uh, that people are also hesitant to take uh, the public traffic that we have to take that into account, what impact that has. The city does a lot, also a lot of promotion. It's a very LA Metro, you see it everywhere. So that's just for the context. And um, due to this COVID thing, uh, there was an article last week saying that bikes are the new toilet paper. So a lot of people are stepping onto bikes. And I have just been here, but I hear from people, there are, there are like bike lanes getting in every neighborhood very mm -hmm. quickly. I mean, it's not going that fast, but you have to realize there is a car culture here. So it's not that the government doesn't want it. Everybody is talking here about green mobility, smart mobility. We have to change it. You don't have to convince the people here, the decision makers, that they have to change. They know it, and it's, it is in the plans. Um, it's in the LA Metro Pen measure, measure uh, M, what is presented by Jan. I just shared in the chat uh, the roadmap. Uh, 2035, uh, which is an integrated comprehensive plan from the city of LA. It also is connected to LACI, which uh, also uh, Mr. Klopper shared right now. It's a great incubation acceleration uh, park with a lot of, lot of uh, interesting things uh, to see. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I think for Dutch people, it's really good to be here and understand the different contexts, where they came from, their legacy, because that is the biggest uh, challenge uh, you, you, will see, you will see here. Also, if you look at the roads, there are almost as many Teslas <coughs> as Mustangs and Dodges these days. So people are really picking up here and not just uh, as, as uh, Michiel said, the rich people, but actually Teslas are very accessible for everybody. So there is rapid change here, but it's a city, actually greater Los Angeles is 18 million people. And it's, mm. it's maybe even more dense than the Netherlands, uh, if you look at overall. It is the largest city in the United States in terms of geographic space. So it's the second largest after New York, and as a Dutch person, you really have to realize um, that this place here is larger than the Netherlands. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to scare you because we're, they are waiting for your innovations and, and definitely come here. And together with the, with the consulate, together with Connect, uh, we are here on the ground in Los Angeles. And we definitely want to help you to find the right doors and to match you with the right people here. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Peter, for your comments. We'd love to see a delegation of California come to Holland and we'd love to host you and uh, see uh, show off our beautiful facilities in the Netherlands. Uh, we got many of those. So with that, I'd, li I'd like to move on to the next speaker. Uh, so next speaker is Miguel Nunes from uh, Fear and Pierce. And uh, Miguel, um, he uh, will be telling us more about uh, the city of captivating creativity. Um, uh, so, Miguel, um, we're curious to hear more about your perspective uh, on uh, and, and your, take a look at your slides. Very excited. Thank you. Great. Good morning, everybody. Can you see me and hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you fine. We see your slides. Very good. Great. Thank you. It's been uh, uh, really interesting to listen to the conversation. I'm with Fair and Peers. My name is Miguel Nunez. And uh, I have been, uh, Fair and Peers is a company of just under 300 folks. We're a transportation planning, engineering, and consulting firm with offices on the East Coast, Rockies, and based on the West Coast. I'm based in and grew up in the city of Los Angeles. So to hear all of these perspectives about the city has been really fascinating. I'm also joined by my colleague, Jeremy Klopp, who you heard a little bit from already. Um, my present today, presentation today is going to really build off what you've heard of, some of that context 
I want to focus on the local and regional aspects of that, because that's where I think there are many opportunities that will arise. Um, a lot of it has to do with bikes, but also thinking about other modes like transit and freight and just understanding some of the structure and agencies that underlie that. So we talked about this a little bit. I removed some of the slides that Jan covered already. Um, but this is the city of Los Angeles on the left. It has a number of communities, places like Brentwood or Hollywood, which are not cities. They're part of Los Angeles, and, and that's the city itself. If you look over to the right, the white area is the city of Los Angeles, but the larger area is LA County, and all of these individual cities are um, their own agencies that have control over their own roadways. And so we'll talk about a few project examples of how that comes up and where there are opportunities to help address that. There are also very large parts of the county where there's very little. Um, and the regional collaboration that we've been talking about is definitely a challenge. We've already talked about some key agencies uh, like um, uh, Metro, Caltrans, uh, some communities like Hollywood. There are also some of those 88 cities like Santa Monica, Pasadena, and the West Hollywood, which are separate from the city of Los Angeles. And again, have their own government, their own Department of Transportation, their own Department of Planning, their own control over infrastructure and land use planning. The other reason why I wanted to talk about this is because this is where Measure R and Measure M is in effect. So while it's true that Metro has a large um, pot of funding and is implementing regional projects, a lot of that is local return that goes to the individual cities where they'll be able to spend that money as they see fit. And again, there are opportunities there within each city. And I'll just make a quick point that if you pull out even further, it to a regional map, LA, while the most people is surrounded by places like Santa Barbara, Ventura, San Diego, Orange County, Riverside, San Bernardino, which are other places with growing populations and where there are also a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Here's the Metro map. This is the 2028 map that has been shown. It's, it's fairly um, modest, nevertheless, um, transit expansion is happening. And one of the real big opportunities, I think, is helping get people to transit, first, last mile. How do we create multimodal um, places where it's, it's easy for people to get to the train? That's important because most of our streets look like this. Yes, that's supposed to be a bike lane on the right uh, next to the curb. And if you can imagine going down a hill next to speeding vehicles and trucks, it just doesn't feel all that present. And so knowing that many of our streets look like this, but there's ample right of way, what are some of the ideas or solutions we can start to talk about? So let me talk about this one really quickly. This is what's called rail to river. It's called that because on the left hand, you have a blue line station and on the right hand side over um, a blue line station over here. And over here, you have the LA river, a transit facility and an active transportation facility. And they want to connect it as well as build some rail in between. The top is what the cross section looks like today. The bottom is one example of what it could look like in the future. Um, the ch and even though it looks like there's a lot of right of way, there's a big challenge to how does this all fit in? There, there's concerns about whether they can make it all fit in, even though you would, might not think that looking at the graphic. And I'll also mention that when this planning and implementation happens, you know, Metro controls a portion over here there's a private railroad entity that controls a portion over here, and then the city has control over what happens over here. So even if Metro offers to pay for everything, there's still a process where everybody has to sort of agree and study with what's ultimately gonna be done, and that's not necessarily a quick and easy process. Here's an example of something that has moved forward. There's a, a, a two-way cycle track protected bike lane that's gonna be connected to Union Station. The main point I'll make here is that even at a place like Union Station, which is a key generator uh, um, of transit and, and pedestrians, this project has gone around, undergone around 10 years of planning and is still in the process of being implemented. So even at that scale of, of, of agreement and, 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 and importance, it's still a very important process to figure something like this out and, and to change a place and really focus on how to move people. Yeah. I don't want to make it all seem bad. There are some good examples and some successful examples. This is the Colorado Esplanade, which is also a two-way protected bicycle lane adjacent to a travel lane in Santa Monica that provides direct access to the Expo line. And so there are examples, again, where this has been done. This was done in the city of Santa Monica. So again, not in the city of LA, a different city, a similar process, but different 
for example, than what would happen in the city of LA, mm -hmm. um, just because they're different agencies. Um, I want to stop there for a minute. We've been talking about transit and transit expansion and the way that getting people to transit is really important. Um, one thing that we're known about, known for in Los Angeles is our freeways. On the left, you have the 110 freeway. This is one of the oldest freeways that we have. It's about a hundred foot right of way for six lanes. On the right side, you have one of our newer freeways. This is about a 370 foot right of way for eight lanes and center running light rail. And so the reason I point this out is because it's a very inefficient space of use, um, inefficient use of space. And that excess right of way that you see on the sides is often considered a nuisance by communities, but in some places has begun, begun to be looked at as an opportunity. So mm -hmm. what you see is a place where this right of way has been turned into a linear park. This is in the city of Linwood. So again, yet another city, this would have involved, you know, a funding agency. They got funding from the state, uh, Caltrans, because it's actually using freeway right of way and the city at a minimum, not to mention the likelihood that there may have been utilities or water, uh, you, uh, uh, other uh, folks that involved or care about this. Nevertheless, it's an example of something that has happened and has started to create positive impacts by providing different um, uh, things like active recreation, passive recreation, even um, community gardens. I wanted to take this slide really quickly to talk about the topic of, of equity. It's a really big topic in Los Angeles in general, but it has been because of events in, in the world and particularly in the US lately. Many of these, like this image here, is in a low income community. There are places where they tend to be bisected by freeways and where quite frankly, the planning paradigm prioritizes the movement of vehicles through communities to commute instead of in many times the actual people living there and how they can get around and get to go shopping more safely or walk their kids to school. And a lot of that is because the planning focuses on this term that's called quality of life. Uh, how can we make people's life better? And inevitably in every community, there's a difference of opinion. Some people feel their quality of life is best served by having an expansive transit system that allows them to walk and bike. Other people feel that their quality of life is best served by allowing them to you know, be convenient, um, clean, and personally serve themselves in their automobile. And so when our paradigm is very focused on trying to serve all of those, we, we frankly do um, a better job of serving some other than others. Just mm -hmm. a couple more slides because I wanna continue talking about freeways for a second. We're not building too many more freeways, but there is a project for the 710 to consider expanding it. And one of the things they're talking about there is what's called a DDI or a diverging diamond interchange. Many of you may have heard or seen this, um, but essentially what it does is it takes the direction of travel and switches it as you go across the freeway. And this is mainly done in an effort to minimize conflicts with other vehicles and make it really easy to get on and off the freeway um, but as you can see from the pads here, the pedestrian and bicyclist um, path to travel really doesn't seem to get much consideration in how this is developed or thought of. And so I think freeways will continue to need to be upgraded. We're going to need to move more vehicles, presumably, you know, if things continue on the current trend. Um, but how can we better integrate bicyclists and pedestrians in that instead of, frankly, just relegating them to wherever there is space? Yeah. Uh, the last couple uh, wanted to mention is freight. Again, not only do we move people either through vehicles or through transit or, or walking and biking, but with ports, and, and I think this is something that's, that's familiar in the Netherlands, ports receiving freight and carrying that to other parts of the state and the country, how can we get better at moving those goods? Um, what are maybe some innovation, some transportation strategies? Are there land use um, considerations that you all use that, that we should consider? And mm -hmm. lastly, I'll leave you with this image. This is from the MP 2035 document that I think Peter uh, left that, that Fair and Peers worked on. And, and what I'll say is planning in Los Angeles is often very aspirational. Um, this document for the mobility plan of Los Angeles envisioned a future where you know people are walking and biking, there's beautiful landscaping, a shared mobility. I've never been to to Amsterdam, but I imagine it would look uh, something like this and people are, are biking and having fun in the Netherlands. So we have a long way to go. I really 
agree with the points that have been made. A lot of it is going to have to do with that regional collaboration, understanding the context and, and helping people understand how many of these strategies and ideas um, are going to help them and their communities. So thank you for, for your time this morning and allowing us to be here. Uh, thank you, Miguel. Uh, very interesting what you're sharing here, and I'm very excited to see a question here from Peter Weissman. I'm a, a, a recent new owner of a high-speed pedal-like bicycle here in the Netherlands, and uh, I imagine uh, that, like here, over 50% of the bicycle seals are now electric, and the high-speed pedal-likes are also becoming part of the equation. Um, so Peter's question specifically is, how are you incorporating faster e-bikes into mobility planning? Uh, should they use the same infrastructure as regular bikes, be on the road with cars or somewhere else? What, what, do you have any thoughts about that? I, I, I do, and I'll ask my colleague to chime in after I'm done, Jeremy. But my, my initial take, to be completely frank with that, is we're, we're not that, you know, in many communities, we're still talking. In that example I gave, the first one about the train and trying to figure out how to get a, um, a bicycle facility next to an area that had a lot of right-of-way, that is actually in a city that is among the lowest income, highest mm -hmm. density, and lowest lowest rates of car ownership in the, in the county. Yep. They yeah. don't have a single bike lane in the city. So mm -hmm. if that happens, that's gonna be their first one. So in a community like that, again, low income, there is no conversation around e-bikes or how to get people from, how to integrate that. It's, it's really about how, how can we do this without negatively impacting traffic? That's frankly the focus of the conversation. In other communities like a Santa Monica or a West Hollywood, perhaps that are are, are further along in the conversation, um, they are they are thinking about that, but they're they're still they're still focusing on the basic infrastructure. I, I would say um, more so than they are thinking about how to how to start to accommodate new aspects of that technology. Jeremy, I don't know if you have anything you'd add, add to that. Sure. Um... You know, in the U.S., there's been a history of support for the concept of vehicular cycling, and and that concept, in many ways, unfortunately, has been codified um, into uh, the vehicle codes in most states. And expectation is, oh, if you're on a fast e-bike, you know, take the lane, um, which is really uh, got significant equity impl implications for uh, riders of all ages and abilities. Um, and so there there really is still disagreement in many parts of the US about uh, appropriate location within the right of way. And, and just getting up to speed, we are now having design guides and manuals like the, the NACDO guide uh, for urban design uh, of bikeways that has many of the aspects of the Dutch Crow manual uh, integrated. Uh, but I would say that this is an area, particularly for um, roadway design and speed separation and vehicle characteristics. Um, there are some classification uh, schemes already based on wattage and power for e-bikes, uh, but very little attention paid to width or uh, weight in terms of cargo bike uh, and space allocation and requirements within the lanes. So the design guidance here is really behind the, the Dutch Crow manual, as an example, uh, in some important ways, and it's making progress. But I think this is another area where, um, you know, the collaboration is really uh, an opportunity that's available. And, and we do a lot of work, Fair and Peers does, in this active transportation design uh, space. Um, so this is, this is an area we would have particular interest in, in partnering with folks as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for your comments. Um, uh, I'd like to move on to the next speaker in the interest of time. So uh, Peter Weissman will be uh, from Arcadis will be sharing some of his insights with us. Um, so without further ado, Peter, um, you can uh, take the microphone. All right. Uh, say thank words about Arcadis as well for the audience. Yeah. Um, yeah thank you very much. I'm just um, uh, uh, pulling up my. Um, Slides. A presentation. The, um, here we go. I think everyone can see that. Hopefully, yes. Yep. yep. You can put it in presentation mode. Yep. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, know, knowing that uh, uh, we're running short on time, I'll. I'll uh, tried to keep it brief. So uh, Peter Weissman uh, with Arcadis uh, in San Francisco, 
Um, I'm the uh, uh, the city executive uh, for um, Mercedes's business in in San Francisco Bay Area, meaning that I oversee uh, our, our work in the in the region, which is about 200 people local. Um, uh, but I also spent uh, a significant amount of time in Los Angeles, so we'll share uh, some insights in in the LA market. Uh, and uh, my presentation is mostly centered around um, you know how um how do you uh mobilize uh, uh dutch mobility expertise in uh in the us and some lessons learned uh as as an individual i've been fortunate enough to call california my home for the past 11 years uh, uh grew up in um uh, let's say the the water resilience space uh as as was pointed out by uh Miguel and, and Jeremy earlier um, and, and obviously there's uh, ample opportunity uh, for that expertise in, in the US as well uh, but today we'll, uh, we'll focus on mobility and um, I'm sure that some of you have seen seen this quote before uh, but you know, uh, just uh, uh, put a fine point on the problem uh, for Elon Musk it's easier to get a rocket into orbit than to commute in Los Angeles and uh, I think to, to many of us uh, that's true, uh, but also uh, if a guy with, with such a, uh, a free and creative mind uh, makes a statement like that, uh, you, you can only imagine how, uh, how severe the problem is. Um, so uh, real brief, and this is mostly, well, I guess for both the Dutch and the American audience, right, so you know, Arcade is uh, as a Dutch company, uh, you know, founded in 1888 uh, um, uh, with, uh, uh, in the Netherlands uh, with no presence in the U.S. until the early 1990s through an acquisition. Uh, and since then, uh, uh, a presence of about uh, 6,000 uh, employees in, in North America at the moment uh, across infrastructure, water, environment and, uh, and buildings of which uh, 700 uh, work, uh, work and live in, uh, in California. Um, and so, you know, on <coughs> uh, uh, mobilizing Dutch mobility in California, I think you know, when, when I uh, you know, look at projects and project opportunities and clients that we want to work for. Uh, there are three three main criteria, right? So I um, you know, look at you know, are we are we technically qualified as a company? Uh, do we have uh, uh, strong connections with uh, with the buyers? And do we understand how to price this opportunity? And um, what I <clears throat> you know, often see uh, from a Dutch context is that uh, looking at these three questions, uh, uh, that uh, the Dutch have very logically have a very strong focus on uh, uh, technical qualifications. Do we have the experience to, to answer the question uh, uh, that, that this client is looking to answer? Um, uh, but are falling short on uh, on connections, uh, which is not surprising uh, because uh, you're, you're trying to enter uh, uh, a new market and uh, uh, but your know, client buying behavior um, is um, is is very much determined by uh, did I go to the same university have uh, have we worked together in the past? Um, do we know? Uh, the same people, and so I guess Michiel early on shared, you know, their strategy is APPM really teaming up with with other uh, local firms, which I think is is a very smart thing to do, um, and and leverage uh, relationships of other companies uh, to um, you know to help sell uh, uh, the services that you're looking to sell. I do think that with a um, a change in the way uh, uh, we're approaching mobility, uh, much more analytics focused. Uh, there, there is disruption going on, which I think um, uh, somewhat uh, flattens uh, the competitive landscape and allows for mo more new entries uh, into into the um, into the field. Uh, yeah, lastly, I would also say, you know, just being uh, local uh, is key. 
um, because um, yeah, we, we talked about the differences between uh, uh, the Netherlands and California, the US in general. Uh, you know, questions here uh, pop up uh, out of nowhere and need to be answered within 24 hours. Uh, mm -hmm. if, uh, if, if you're not able to do so, uh, you're you're out of favor, uh, and don't be uh, uh, don't be surprised if you don't hear anything back for for six weeks uh, that the client is looking over what what you submitted. Uh, but that's a, a very, I guess, uh, a different way of doing business uh, than than the Dutch are 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 used to. And uh, responsiveness is key. Um, and and um, if you tie that to being locally present, you're able to, to much easier serve your clients if you're thinking about your investment strategy. Certainly, uh, you know, make sure that uh, that you're locally present. Mm -hmm. uh, so how how do we put that in practice, right? So I have three project examples uh, of you know, the, the broad portfolio of projects uh, that, uh, that we have, but where you know, uh, our, our Dutch expertise has helped us uh, wind projects in California. So this is uh, in Northern California, city of San Jose, uh, uh, together with uh, Dutch architects Bentham Kral, uh Arcadis is designing uh, uh, Deredon Station, um, currently uh, a station for uh, Caltrain, uh, but envisioned to be uh, a large transit-oriented development uh, where multiple uh, real modes of uh, are coming together uh, uh, both current Caltrain uh, as well as uh, a potential for uh, future BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit, uh, the light rail of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Agency uh, and potential uh, for future uh, California high-speed rail um, uh, mixed in with commercial and residential development uh, with Google uh, being the kind of the anchor uh, landowner in the station area, um, uh, looking to house uh, you know, ten thousand uh, employees at this uh, at this site. Um, when when this project was originally envisioned, uh, uh, there uh, the Dutch consulate got in contact uh, uh, with with project proponents. Uh, I realized that, that it would be um, a good idea to invite them uh, to the Netherlands uh, and to look at a number of, of train stations, uh, mainly Rotterdam Central Station, Amsterdam Central Station, uh, and uh, that certainly um, uh, provided new insights to the project proponents on how they wanted this, this station area to look like and uh, and ultimately allow us to put in uh, a winning a winning bid. Um, the other project here is... Uh, Peter, Peter? Uh, yes, go ahead. Peter, can I ask you to to wrap up in the interest of time? I, I let time slide a little bit, but we're getting close to the hour, so I'd like okay. to move from Cubic as well. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, uh, briefly, LADOT, um, uh, a, a bike connection study uh, where we use big data uh, to quantify the stress uh, that bikers are experiencing on on different streets. Uh, work with the community to identify uh, shortages uh, in in the current bike uh, uh, network, uh, and ultimately uh, provided the city with a uh, analysis of reduction in vehicle miles traveled using other transit modes. Um, lastly, uh, on the examples is, is Code Orange, is an is a Arcadis-led hackathon that we hosted last year, uh, where we brought uh, 55 uh, uh, Arcadis analysts, uh, data analysts and scientists together uh, to work on uh, a number of key uh, uh, mobility challenges uh, related to big events and curbside parking uh, some of which are currently being further developed by the city. Uh, then lastly, on, on the outlook uh, related to COVID-19, uh, obviously we'll, we'll see a major reduction in uh, available funding. Uh, however, um, uh, infrastructure is high on the agenda from a um, 
uh, from a stimulus perspective, as well as that new legislation is being introduced uh, to support sustainable transit development. Uh, no, most notably, uh, Senator Scott Wiener currently looking at um, uh, uh, limiting the ability to challenge uh, uh, sustainable transit development in the CEQA process, process the permitting process, which would uh, on average shave off about three, three to five years of new projects being able to go from um, uh, design into into construction, uh, which is a major major win uh, for for what we're talking about here today. Uh, so with that, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate your views and beautiful pictures here. It looks lovely. Um, so I'd like to move on to Cubic. Uh, so we got Boris Karsh here with us today. Um, I'm very excited to hear from Cubic. Cubic has been a major force in uh, creating phone-based ticketing in several um, metro areas, and love to hear some more about uh, about that. Boris, Mike is yours. Great. Thank you very much. And again, being very cognizant of time, I kind of cut down, kind of was going to talk about, I think, focus on a couple of key elements really around, you know, how do we see technology getting integrated into this, you know, exciting world of shared mobility, shared uh, mobility infrastructure that um, yeah, many of the other speakers talked about. And I'll try as part of doing that, talk a little bit about our experience working yeah. Uh, yeah, with cities, Los Angeles, LA Metro, you know, is one of our long-standing customers. I deliberately not talk much about the LA region, knowing so many of the speakers have already covered that. Uh, so I'm going to draw just quickly, you know, uh, Cubic, yeah, we've been in the in business of doing uh, mobility technology focused on payments, roads management, etc., for coming on to 50 years. Uh, so, you know, long experience dealing with government, uh, working globally across big cities, a lot of experience working with government, uh, in particular, I think some of the other speakers alluded to, right, the kind of multi-stakeholder environments that are so critical to manage to yeah, do business effectively, right, in complex regions like Los Angeles, and, you know, whether that's countries or, um, you know, large cities, right, it, it's never a single buyer, right, particularly when we're talking government, right, we're talking complicated uh, networks of people that collectively make decisions. So, you know, one of the lessons just on that is, you know, and I think some of the other speakers alluded to that, forming local partnerships, doing local offices, you know, uh, finding the right teams uh, to collaborate with. And I think that becomes more and more important if I kind of move on, right? If we envisage a world where mobility is or mobility systems are integrated together where they're managed as a mobility system, I think it necessitates that, you know, the industry partners focus really heavily on collaborating together to bring solutions uh, together. So I'm really pleased we've got this kind of forum, right, to explore how multiple companies can work together on projects. Um, so just briefly, uh, Lucas did ask me to kind of talk about some of the lessons learned from our industry kind of change point of view. Uh, again, in the interest of time, maybe the key point is, right, uh, with the advent of mobile data, really, you know, um, five, 10 years ago, we're seeing massive changes in mobility technology, right? Mobile is becoming front and center, right? Uh, devices, it used to have to work technology-wise in the field on the assumptions you can't connect them to a computer, you know, maybe for a week, for a day, et cetera, right? Moving to an everyday connected world and the travelers that we help cities create experiences for, right, really expect instant information, mobile first, etc. And, and New York is just one of the more recent projects where we've, you know, helped cities upgrade existing infrastructure. And I think that's critical, right? Most of the uh, cities we'll work with have existing investments in infrastructure, whether that's physical infrastructure or in our case, um, technology infrastructure, so coming up with pathways that maximize reuse of existing infrastructure. So for example, New York, right, uh, we managed to preserve their investment in, you know, what you see on the left-hand side, the gate by retrofitting the uh, technology was kind of key, and then creating new and exciting user experiences, which I think, you know, particular 
now with COVID in the transit world having scared you know uh, people away from transit, creating not just exciting but also safe user experiences, right? So contactless, you know, certainly uh, you know, assures people uh, you know uh, in a more kind of infectious conscious world, right? Uh, on on the user experience is is kind of key. Um, I think just you know working with cities, I touched on some of those points, right? It's that really deep sense of forming partnerships with cities, right? Being deeply receptive to you know that um, yeah ultimately right it's the the political needs of the stakeholders that fund projects um, yeah uh, the high visibility of pretty much anything we do right particularly if we're talking about mobility we're talking about public projects right how the public perceives it is it, kind of critical and you know the the other element is right really forming yeah a deep commitment uh, to success. You know, uh, our experience, and we certainly built a business out of, yeah, for the last 50 years on long-term uh, partnerships. You know, nothing will ever, I think, on projects, particular technology, I think, is a even more so, right? Always go uh, perfect. It's how you deal with, you know, issues, how you commit to success ultimately for the cities uh, that buy the technologies. Uh, that need to deliver ultimately right quality of life, equity, and some of the other things people talked about on the call. Yeah, that that attitude of partnership versus a um, you know kind of customer vendor type relationship. I, I we certainly feel, particularly in the government space, is is a pretty big element of of long term success. And then bringing together right on behalf of you know uh, the customers the right partner network. You know it's. Yes, cities are you know not bad through their procurement processes, right, to procure projects, but they're not really well suited, right, to integrate things together. So I think it falls on us as industry to form those partnerships I talked about, bring solutions together, and I think that's the opportunity for people on the call, right, to really collaborate with each other, with local partners, uh, uh, to deliver solutions and success uh, for customers. And then maybe I'll just skip forward. I know mobility of service is a really interesting topic and we can probably spend half an hour on it. But again, it's an example, right, where we're shifting right from siloed management, right? We earlier talked about managing road infrastructure as a shared space, right? This is about bringing the same thing together from a technology and user experience point of view in mobile through integrated payment experiences. Again, deeply reliant on yeah, partnerships, connecting through technology, Different solutions, you know, whether that's a electronic bike share uh, back office with a transit payment solution, with you know a, a ride share provider, etc. Et right, all of that really requires a different way of working and different technologies to to integrate that together. And then, I think uh, Stefan earlier, I think almost set this up right, saying you know we're not talking enough about the the integration. And I think the, maybe the the finishing point is. Yeah, even if we just talk about, you know, bringing together, um, you know, different payments and a mobility as a service point of view, you know, we certainly have a very strong view and, you know, we're doing a really exciting project in Sydney, Australia, where, you know, we're bringing together also on the traffic side, right? I think we're moving towards managing mobility systems as a whole, right? Optimizing the flow of people, vehicles, et cetera, right? And so we have a really strong view that, you know, that requires, right, um, the bringing together of all of the data elements into, you know, um, you know, situational awareness systems, whether they're control rooms, analytics-based uh, systems, and then really using, right, the power of connected technology, like, you know, uh, connected sensor-driven intersections, with you know mobile connected users to you know, optimize the network as a whole and you know what it really means also is working kind of differently right with with cities because the reality is right and I think some of the speakers talked about it Los Angeles is a good example right I think we're talking 80 plus right individual local government areas right uh, users don't really care right when they move whether you're moving from local government area A to local government area B, right? They kind of expect those two areas to collaborate. And, you know, if one intersection, for example, is in city A and the next intersection is in city B, and if they happen to have the red and, and the green on, you know, 
exactly opposite times, right? The traffic doesn't really flow together, right? So that bringing together the coordination, right? Uh, technology can help a lot, but I think our collective efforts of working with cities and helping cities collaborate, right, together for the benefit of greater regions, I think is kind of the, the secret of success. And I kind of leave it at that, I think, just being cognizant of time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Boris. It's uh, very interesting. So uh, one quick question for you. So what about data ownership of all the data that's generated in, in the process of, of handling these systems? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question and a really big topic of debate. You know, we certainly, as, uh, as Cubic, always took a view, right, the data ultimately, right, is a, is a public good. It's created by the investments that our customers make in the technology we provide to them. I think the the conversation is getting more uh, sophisticated on that, you know, because obviously, um, yeah, private industry I think has has potentially um, yeah room to help make better use of that data. But I think again, it's it's one of those topics that, in my view, coming at it with a first of a what's the outcome we're trying to achieve, right? What's the um, you know, user privacy considerations, obviously, and the trust, right? Because, you know, this shared mobility vision I talked about, right, is ultimately reliant on users trusting their data into the system, right? And everybody in the system treating that data with the, the respect it deserves. Uh, I think the data ownership should naturally follow from that as a principle, but I know it's a big topic. You know, the one bit I'm fairly certain of is, if everybody believes the data should be held closely to their chest, not shared, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're ever going to get the the outcomes we need for cities, nor the commercial success that uh, you know people are looking for by perhaps uh, holding onto that data. But you know, yeah. I'm just one voice of that in a very complicated topic. That's certainly a prickly topic. Yeah. Well, thank you for your for your uh, expertise and sharing it with the, with the audience today. I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to be cognizant of the time. We are five minutes past the the ending time of, of this webinar right now. So let me uh, uh, look around and see if there's any uh, remaining questions. Uh, if so, please use the uh, the, the chat function. Um, I don't see any right now. I know some people have already left uh, the webinar, other commitments. So I uh, just want to thank everybody. Thank Mika for orga organizing this and, and, and Jan Top and, and all the folks who uh, support this speaking and and otherwise, so thank you very much for your um, efforts and putting this together. And I think one main conclusion that remains with me is no matter how uh, good we get in webinars and other stuff, mobility remains a people's business, right? <laughs> so we hope to see you soon in the beautiful country of the Netherlands. We hope to visit you soon again also and enjoy all the beautiful scenery that we've seen on the, on the slides today. And uh, uh, wish you uh, uh, productive participation in the remainder of this trade mission. And uh, very curious to uh, see uh, an evaluation afterwards, uh, Jan, uh, to see how the experience has been for people. So again, thank you very much and have a great day, everybody. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you, you Lucas. All.